Hi everybody, my name is Hannah and this is Pepper and Pine and I have a review video to share with you today. We've completed our Ibn Battuta main lesson block and I want to share with you the books that we used, the ones that we didn't finish, the ones that we didn't get to at all, and the new books that I didn't get to share with you when I was putting together this unit. And so I'm going to start with those new books first so that I can give you a reason why we bought them and how we use them. And I also want to share with you the projects that we did, the recipes, that we made and our overall impression of this unit. So I'm going to dive into the new material first and the first book I want to show you is by Michael Gomez. It's called African Dominion, A New History of Empire in Early and Medieval West Africa. This book we actually purchased when we were doing our West Africa main lesson block which covered three empires including Mali. And by the time we got this book, our unit was already done. And so we didn't dive into this. Now, this is high school, college, you know, adult quality. This isn't maybe something that you could do as a read aloud with young children. And the books that I'm sharing with you today are either for really young elementary. Well, actually, maybe just elementary. Uh, they're picture books. And then I have three books, four books that are definitely high school quality and beyond. And this is one of them. And so because I'm homeschooling an elementary student as well as a high school student, our units these days are looking a little bit different. We're including a lot more material that is assigned reading or it's read aloud that I'm doing with my 14 year old son that my nine year old daughter is listening in, but not really having to participate in those readings and definitely doesn't have any work associated with those books. So this book, had we included it in our West Africa unit, it would have been something that we would have read sparingly. There's no way we could have read the whole book in one of those short units that we're doing that last uh, anywhere from three to six weeks. So this would have been assigned reading for my son. And then in addition to that, because it's a little bit more of a dense book, we probably would have just chosen certain chapters to read to, to complement what we were already doing. So for today, I just want to point out one chapter. This is chapter seven, Intrigue, Islam, Ed, and Ibn Battuta. So there actually is some references to Ibn Battuta in this book. However, the references to him are actually references that Ibn Battuta made about West Africa when he visited uh, on his travels. And so if you look at the book, The Travels of Ibn Battuta, or if you look at the original in Arabic, I believe it was in Arabic, of the Rihla, the, the book that Ibn Battuta wrote on his return, then you're going to find information, uh, his reflections on the empire of Mali and his experience there and the two kings, well, he basically, I think, just saw Mansa Suleiman and then was in a in a gathering where Mansa Musa was there as well. So I think he, I, I, I think he met probably both kings, but I'm actually not 100% sure because I can't remember. And I know that his meeting with Mansa Suleiman wasn't as favorable as he expected. So this book actually is using Ibn Battuta's Rihla as reference. So if you're reading just this book and you're not reading the Rihla, then you'll know that, and this is a translation, you'll know that the information that's gathered in here just on those sections are actually based on Ibn Battuta as well as two other records Ibn Hajar and Ibn Khaldun. And so we also included Ibn Khaldun's book called Ibn Ibn Khaldun Intellectual Biography by Robert Irwin, but I don't have that to show with you, show for you today because we got it as an audiobook. And so we're listening to that book, uh, in addition to this unit and the other units that we're doing for our Silk Road. So our Silk Road unit was in response to our Middle Ages unit that focuses on Europe that we started years ago. And we had included maybe a total of five lessons on other parts of the world at that time. And then once we did that, we were thinking, wow, there's way more, um, there's like a wealth of information and there's such richness in the rest of the world. So we decided to just focus on our Silk Road uh, unit study, which then grew into another five unit studies. And so when we decided to focus on the Silk Road, we that's when we learned about Mansa Musa, 
And then we decide to make our West Africa unit its own unit. And then we decide to make our Ibn Battuta unit its own unit rather than just learning about these individuals or these uh, regions or these time periods as individual lessons that complemented a greater unit, we decided to turn them into their own units. And that's why we ended up with so many smaller units. Some are big and some are small that that complement basically our Middle Ages unit that we started years ago. So that's kind of a little background on why it's grown this way and why when we're doing this book in this unit, there are also, it also coordinates with other units and that's why no one unit is ever truly done. <laughs> but I did want to share with you our reflections of the materials that we've used so far and what we're continuing to use and how we're using it with our other units. So this book would work well for a West Africa unit it. And then we did, um, of course, use just that one chapter to coordinate with our Ibn Battuta unit. One other book that you would not have seen in either our West Africa unit or how we put together this unit is the book, If You Were Me and Lived in the Ancient Mali Empire by Carol Roman. We love this series of books. I think we now own maybe seven uh, of these books in this series and we are on the hunt for more. Now the first one that I got I think might have been on ancient China. That was when I was putting together our ancient China unit along with all of these other units that coordinate with the Silk Road unit and I was kind of not super pleased when I first received the book. You can see that the illustrations are on one side and they take up about two-thirds of the two-page spread and then there's a white space here that has all of the you know, the text. And the illustrations I didn't find mm, super engaging. And this one's a little bit better quality, but the other books that we had, it looked like the illustrations had been super enlarged and they just, they looked fuzzy. And then, uh, so I thought, oh gosh, you know, it's not really the best quality. Anyway, I was so wrong. We read the book and we loved it so much. And then we ended up buying a lot more. And then we, the illustrations totally grew on us. It seems like that was kind of the style. I don't know how they did it, but it was kind of the style. And we ended up really enjoying the illustrations of the other books in the series. There are a couple of different illustrators for some of the books. I think the Renaissance Italy one has a different illustrator altogether, a different style entirely. But the writing was surprisingly engaging. I, I, I was not expecting both my daughter and I to really enjoy it. And we really did. So basically the book is, if you were me, so if you were a child and you lived in ancient Mali or any other of the books, you know, that were written, it would, it starts out by saying, you know, what your life would be like and what your name might be like. And just the idea of if you were a boy and you might be named this, and if you were a girl, you might be named this, that little bit of connection really ties the child, in my opinion, this is my experience with my daughter, to the whole book and everything that happens afterwards. And ev now when we get the new book, the first thing she wants to do is say, um, what, what would my name be? And then, you know, we look that up first to, to see like, oh, you know, I can't wait to get to that page to find out what my name would be if I, you know, lived in whatever ancient civilization is talked about. So I highly recommend this book series because we have really enjoyed them and they're also quite lengthy surprisingly but they're super engaging in my opinion and though we don't typically read any of our books all in one sitting because we're doing so many books in our main lesson block and in our unit study that we will have sometimes we'll have like say like a folk tale or a, a, a more um like a shorter picture book and we'll do that as part of our opening activities and then we'll start to read our other materials and we'll read maybe a chapter or five pages or we'll read for a half an hour you know it kind of just depends on the book and the day and so this book we will typically do it in like two to three days just so that we can spread it out over the week to include other materials as well but even if you read it in one sitting which sometimes we do because it's just kind of a page turner that way then we will you, you know, we'll read it all at once and it's, it, you know, it carries you through the whole book in a really great way. And we have just really enjoyed them. We've learned a lot and the illustrations are really good on me. So there are a lot in this series. I highly recommend them. Um, and now we're on the hunt to find however many we can to 
complement all of our units. And of course, we're all reading them as soon as they come in rather than waiting for our units. So those were the two books that you may not have seen or you definitely didn't see when we were putting together this unit. And the other thing that I want to share with you, which is also part of our Golden Age of Islam unit, is this DIY Dome of the Rock. This is made with like a foam core and a printed on printed paper. And then you can assemble the Dome of the Rock. And I saw this, my friend Della over at Beauty of Play on her Instagram account. She had constructed this as part of her uh, Islam unit, Golden Age of Islam, or just that time period. And it was so beautiful. And so it was a little bit difficult to find, I have to say. Uh, but you can find all of the materials that we've used on the blog post that accompanies this video. That link is down in the description box below. And then you can see all of the projects that we did, the tutorials, and even the things that were part Part of other units that coordinated with this unit, you're going to find that all in the blog post. So I did not include this in how we were putting together this unit. This is going to be for one of our other units, but if you are not doing all of the other units that we're doing that coordinate with our Silk Road and Golden Age of Assam, and you're just, just doing, uh, say, an Explorers unit or an Ibn Battuta unit, and I have to say, once we started exploring Ibn Battuta, we found other explorers that came before him that were totally intrigued to learn about. But if you're just going to do one on Ibn Battuta, then I would recommend that you include uh, this project because the thing is, is that while we were putting together this unit and a lot of the, say a lot of the recipes that we did for this unit ended up being North African or Moroccan recipes. And the thing is, is that Ibn Battuta, though he was born in Morocco, um, he he left when he was a teenager and he traveled the world. And so an Ibn Battuta unit means that you can go from, you know, Spain and Morocco and West Africa, all the way to China and the Maldives and uh, India. And so it's like a, it's a world history if you decide to do Ibn Battuta because it also goes through about 25 to 30 years, um, a little more than actually 30 years because he goes home and then he goes up to Spain and then down to, uh, Mali and then back up to Morocco. So you can, so you can really travel the whole world with this unit. And we, we did it so much because we were doing other units that were in other parts of the world. We actually kept this Ibn Battuta unit focused more on the, his, his books and the travel, but all of our recipes are all North African and Morocco. So I just want to say that you could actually really explore other areas with this unit. So you'll be able to see the construction of this and the tutorial for this in our Golden Age of Assam, uh, unit study or main lesson block, but I did want to share it with you here as well. Okay, so the next thing I want to share with you are the projects that we did that now are finished. So these ones, I did have one of them finished, but you can also find the tutorial on our, how we, we put together our leather journals or travel journals. Uh, all those, uh, all those tutorials are in a single playlist and that playlist is also down in the description box below. So if you just want to see like everything that we did, you can just tap on that playlist. Of course, you can also visit the website pepperandpine.com and go to our Ibn Batuta, uh, the travels of Ibn, ba Ibn uh, the travels of Ibn Batuta, uh, blog post. So we did our little travel journals using these pre-made travel notebooks that we picked up at a local craft store and the only thing that we did was we altered them by adding this sundala that you can find at the rustic home and it just kind of takes a store-bought product and makes it your own with its own personalization and i find this to be a really super great way to add a, a hand hands-on project to your unit without having to do something from scratch However, we ended up not using these at all. And I'm kind of disappointed, but I'm actually not surprised. This is a, this is really small. And for my daughter who's nine, this would really not be suitable as a main lesson book or as a way to do her writing or her illustrations. It would just be a little bit too challenging. For my 14 year old, had we not done our other notebook, then I would have had him do a lot of his writings in here. But again, this is kind of small and, and wouldn't have left a lot of room for illustrations. Or you could do it a little bit more like a travel journal and do something kind of daily with just a couple of lines and then maybe just a little sketch versus a full illustration. So anyway, it's still a really good idea, but we did not use it because we ended up using our main lesson books. So for our the main lesson books that we used, one of them was a project. And let me move some of these things so that I can keep track of what I've already shared with you. 
So this is our, this is how we ended up making our leather journal, which ended up being kind of like our travel journal for Ibn Battuta, if you kind of imagine, you know, that he kept a journal. Um, and I, I think he did, and I think it was Marco Polo who didn't keep a journal, but then wrote everything when he came back. Anyway, there's a tutorial on how uh, we made this. We used that handmade paper, which we still have a lot left over. So I, I probably only used half of the handmade paper. And there's I actually put too many pages in here. So he only needed, I think, maybe less than 20 pages. And... He has his he has his uh, the written portion at the top, and then his illustration at the bottom. So he so he's done um, he's done a really beautiful job. I want to show you one of the illustrations, which was a map. Oh, that's nice. That's a yurt being transported, and oh, this one really beautiful map that he did at the bottom of his written work. Anyway, this paper is handcrafted in India. You can find it at the Leather Village. And it is cotton antique paper. And I think that I had not shared where where you could find it in the tutorial. So I apologize, but it's going to be on the website so you can find it there. That information um, of, of specifically of this of this paper. However, the paper is from Amazon from and, and it's it's really hard to find things again sometimes when it's just kind of a one of a kind kind of stuff. Um, one of a kind kind of thing. <laughs> so if you can find something like this or just go to the actual vendor or if you just want to get, make your own uh, or buy your own handmade style paper, then you could make your own journals and kind of make it look antique is the whole reason why we wanted to go with something like this. So this notebook ended up being my son's main lesson book for these units and he, uh, for his written work, he used the adventures of Ibn, Ibn Battuta and what he did was we read this aloud as part of our lessons but then he went in afterwards and would refresh himself on each of the chapters and then for each of the chapters he would write a very short narration and then add an illustration and that's what you saw in his notebook that each chapter actually had its own page and then uh, the, the written portion is at the top and then the illustration is at the bottom and that's how he did his main lesson work and the book that he primarily used was this one to for the for the content even though we read other books this is the only one that I had him do written work for so let me talk to you about this book and then I'll show you my daughter's main lesson book and tell you what she ended up writing about so this book is called The Adventures of, of Ibn Battuta. And the first time we read this, I think it was back in 2010, I wasn't super impressed with it. And, uh, you know, it was, just, it was really a thrilling adventure of his life, but I wasn't super impressed with the way the author decided to write the book. So the next time around, so this time that we we're uh, approaching this unit, I decided to get an actual translation of his Rihla, his uh, travel journal. So this is the travels of, of Ibn Battuta and it is edited by Tim McIntosh Smith. And so I thought we would get something that was a little bit more accurate. So just a translation. And uh, I thought that it would just be a great way to get his whole story and, you know, all the things that he did without any bias, I guess, is what I was looking for. It ended up being a, a super boring read. <laughs> I apologize. I think we only got to about page, mm, gosh, I don't even think we got to page 50. Uh, by the time we just had to just put it aside. It was a laborious read. It was detailed. It was... Um, it was, <laughs> it was a little bit on the dry side, but it was really good in the sense that it had just everything. I mean, everything. What was curious was that the emotional highlights that are then taken from this book and then brought into this book, I feel are, are, are better well done in this book. So then by the time we were done with, I don't know, 30 to 50 pages of this book, we put it aside, we went back to read this book, and then had a completely different impression of this book. The second time around, I really appreciated what the author was able to do in this book, having read the actual translation of the original. 
Okay, so some parts in here where, for instance, the part where Ibn Battuta has only just left home and he's maybe only, oh gosh, maybe a week's journey, maybe two weeks journey out from his home and he's in, uh, he's being, re he and his companions are being received by the town that they are going to stay in maybe for the night or a few days. And uh, his companions that he's traveling with, they are well known in the town or they have traveled there before. Maybe they're from the town, but the whole town, the whole village is receiving them. They've crowded around their camels. They're like touching them, saying hello, asking how they're doing, re you know, really joyous to see them. And Ipatuta is on his own. No one's come to greet him. I imagine that maybe some homesickness is set in and he's in tears he's crying he's he, homesick he's lonely he's he's just sad and the way that the way that it's said in this book is like you'd have to really imagine like what it might have been like when he only just says a few things like I was sad or I was crying or no one came to greet me you really have to kind of interpret what that might feel like and what might what that might be like and so in this book by Ross Dunn, he does, he does what I think is, um, I don't want to say a better job, but he, you kind of feel it more. You're like, oh, like poor young man, he's just left his family and he's all alone and he's, he's got no one and he's, he's, he's lonely. And then so the village people see that. They see that he's sad. They see that he's crying. They see that he's alone. And so they, 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 they then come to greet him and make him feel welcome. And it's just this whole turn of being super lonely to being received. And it's, it's a, just a beautiful reception. So when I read it in this book and I remember that scene so well, even after 10 years, and I was kind of anticipating a little bit more from the actual, his actual journal, I was a little bit disappointed. So not that this is not going to be a great book if you actually finish it, because we did not finish it. So I just want to let you know, we had to put it aside. It was just not working for us. This could end up being a really rich resource, giving you way more information that you're, than you're going to find in some of the other books written about Ibn Battuta. And so I don't want to discourage you from reading this, but I do want to just warn you that for our purposes, it didn't work. Um, I think it's, it is definitely a high school quality or beyond, uh, you know, college quality book that you could do for, um, assigned reading or for your own information. But as a, as a tool or as a book for our particular unit study, for our purposes, it didn't work so well. So we ended up going back to this book. I had my son reread this so that he could create his content, his written work for his main lesson book. And then I ended up, you know, liking this one better. However, there are just a few things here and there that just kind of are a little bit irksome that kind of rub me the wrong way. Um, just as a Muslim reading, you know, about my own my own history. Uh, but other than that, I think it's a really great resource because the author gives you context for what Ibn Battuta is is going into. So he get, he kind of sets the stage and, and says, you know, at this time period, this part of the world, this is what's going on. You know, this is the political situation or this is the geography. And then he brings in actual quotes from Ibn Battuta. And then he also puts those quotes into context. So it's really well done in that respect. And so I'm sorry that I didn't like it the first time, but I do like it the second time. Let me show you my daughter's main lesson book and the work that she's doing for uh for this unit and other units so she actually she actually i don't know how this happened but she actually started the book um i'm gonna say backwards but actually the way that you would have a an arabic book because arabic books are written from right to left versus english which is written from left to right and so our books are this way but arabic books are this way Anyway, she began this way, and I, I can't remember if it's because she messed up on the first, um, on her first page. That's, that's an L. That's just a, a curly L. <laughs> and I, that looks like a frog. I don't know what happened here. So I think she ended up coming here instead. I don't remember. And the thing is, is that, uh, on occasion, I will, 
if it's the very first page and they've really botched up like this, I will just rip out that very first page. Now, it might have been that she already went and did this page before I recognized, or maybe she did this page first and then realized it was in the back and then tried to go back and do the proper first page. However, we're not going to be able to rip this page out. So what we will do is we will try to incorporate this into another title page and kind of just fix it up so it's not just this kind of random page in there. When children mess up on their main lesson books, you have two choices. You can either cover the entire page by pasting it down with another piece of paper and they can start all over, or you can rip out the page. However, because this is bound with staples, and by the way, this is from A Child's Dream, and this is, the I feel, the largest main lesson book they have in this orientation. I don't believe they are available any longer, and honestly, this was a little bit too big for my taste. I prefer the ones that are just one size smaller than this, especially since she's nine. This would be really great for, like, say, a five, six, seven-year-old, but a nine-year-old can do one of the smaller main lesson books. It's easier to write and, you know, fill the page and whatnot. So when you are removing a page that's already staple bound, you, whatever page you remove, it's going to remove that back page too. So you have to be really cautious of doing that. It depends on your child whether they want perfection or whether they can work with what they've done. If it's like, you know, if they've made like a huge error or, or whether they want to paste in a new, a new sheet. You as a parent, as a teacher will know best which avenue to take with your child depending on, you know, their temperament and, um, what they're trying to achieve. And so I just, I try to work with my children as best as I can for, you know, the, the best outcome. I want them to be really happy with their main lesson book in the end. Okay, so that was her intro page. Then we were going to do a map, and this was definitely beyond her skill set completely. I should not have even offered that as a, a main lesson book entry. Then she also has her China entries in here as well. And she, she, this is, I think, her first official history main lesson book. And so we are still working on getting the, uh, like where you do the illustration and where you do the writing down. That's not quite, uh, come through very well yet. And so basically, she's got a page here that just has, uh, writing, but it doesn't have an illustration. And I'm not sure which illustration that's supposed to go for. Then we have this one for Genghis Khan. And then, uh, for this is more of his writing, I believe, that goes with the illustration. So maybe she's an, she needs another illustration here. This is from the traveling man. This is for the Ibn Battuta portion of this main lesson block, and this is the the chalk drawing that we did for this main lesson block. And then she's got her writing over here. So typically. You would do your illustration here and then do your writing here. Uh, and if you did something like this, you might include like a little caption here where you maybe wouldn't draw, like say the scene, and then you could, you know, kind of like a book and you would, you could do some of the written work here. And then she's got some more, uh, entries throughout. This is, I think, for ancient China and this as well is for in Batuta. So it's a little bit all over the place, but that's okay. This is her first history main lesson book. And, um, and I think it looks great even with it not being the way I expected. Like that's, you know, those are my expectations. She, she's doing just fine. I want to share with you the crayons that she's using for her main lesson book. These are stock mar crayons. We've got the stick and we also have the block and that's what she's using for her illustrations. And then for her written work, she's using either a pencil or color pencils to do that. Okay, let's uh, move on to the books that she's using primarily for, uh, her, actually, you know, I forgot to share with you the color pencils that my son is using for his main lesson book. So let me quickly share that with you. These are actually watercolor pencils. And so what he has done is he has used these to illustrate and then he has taken a paintbrush, light, light water, not too much, and then just kind of blended all those colors together. I'll show you an example in a second, but let me show you this. Oh, I forgot to tell you who this set is by. This one 
is by Kohinoor, and I really like their color pencils. They have uh, a variety of them, and I find that the colors are really rich and beautiful, and same goes with their watercolor pencils. I really like the, the look of them once you add the water to it. We also have Derwent watercolor pencils as well and the reason why i love 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 this set and actually hasn't gotten as much use as some of our other sets is for the color range and so if you can see that these colors are all these wonderful earth tones that are just right for a lot of the illustrations that we're doing for our history units we end up going through our blues our browns and our greens far faster than our pinks and our reds and our oranges and our purples. And those end up, you know, we've gone through so many color pencil sets over the years and we just have like a huge collection of those, uh, those flor floral colors, I suppose. And so we, I, I liked this set because it was primarily these earth tones that would work really well for us. And so I just want to show you again, um, kind of like what it looks like when you add the water to it. And my favorite illustration from his is this, the, the I love maps. <laughs> and so that's, you know, that's kind of like how it looks. Um, it's these, these colors, either, uh, he didn't use a lot of pigment with them, or, um, maybe he used more of the of these colors they didn't come out quite as rich and as bright as some of the other watercolor illustrations we've done with these color pencils all right let's put um, all of this aside and let me show you the books that my daughter used to refer to when doing her uh, main lesson book entries and so we read the traveling man and we also read the amazing travels of Ibn Battuta. So these were both more her age group, even younger as well. And then we have pretty much nothing for say upper elementary and middle school. And then we just bounce right into say high school and college level. So we, we only have those two kind of groupings of books, two for my older son. And then in addition to the, the West Africa book, and then two for my daughter. My son totally listened to these picture books, but my kids are not huddled around me the way they used to be when they were little. So um, my daughter is the one that enjoyed the illustrations. So let me take you back actually to The Traveling Man. This is a, a book that we've had for a while. I think the illustrations are stunning. They are so gorgeous and so rich. This was inspiration for our chalk drawing. And then all, all of the illustrations are so beautiful. So we, we read this book a couple of times. And then when it came time to do our written work, I had her choose illustrations in here. After, after I told her to, to do at least this illustration, then I had her choose whatever illustrations she wanted. And actually, I had uh, this one I had called it for our China unit. If you saw it in the in the main lesson book, I she had this illustration, but actually it was for the Ibn Battuta unit. And so uh, it's probably when he went to China, which it is. It looks like the Chinese landscape, but it's actually for our Ibn Battuta unit. Anyway, uh, when it came time to her came time for her to do her written work, she had a couple of options. She could do copy work or she could write her own narrations. And at this point, she's more interested in doing copy work because it's easier for her versus my son who does almost everything as original narrations. He, over his homeschool lifetime, he's done very few copy work uh, entries, a lot more of his own narrations, um, so on occasion, some copy work, on occasion, some dictation. Now, copy work is great for the younger students, especially if they struggle with writing. So I don't want to tell my daughter, okay, that's it for the copy work. You have to create your own narrations unless I'm feeling like, okay, at least one in the whole main lesson book. But otherwise, I think that copy work is a really great alternative to writing your own work, especially for younger students who may struggle with either sentence structure or grammar or spelling, at least they can put something in their book that that looks really good, that they are proud of, that wasn't such a struggle. 
Uh, dictation is also a really great thing to do for their entries for their main lesson books as well. So for the copy work, what I, do, or, yeah, what, for the copy work, what I do for my daughter is I will just ask her to choose her own passage to write about that complements the picture. Or for, in this case, for this book, if you'll notice, there's the actual content here, but they've done this really cool thing where they've included some text here, which actually kind of coordinates from the previous page. So it's kind of like, here's the travel part. Here's what happens when you got to that place. And now we're going to travel again and take you to the next, you know, destination. And so sometimes I might just have her copy just that little bit with the illustration or she can copy a couple of sentences of the content and then and then that's fine and so she has chosen some of the other other illustrations in this book to include in her main lesson book and then she's used this book as copy work inspiration i suppose uh, for her entries okay and there's actually the dome of the rock which would coordinate with this project and uh, so I think that just using a couple of the picture books and including other projects within it is completely fine if you've got anywhere up to middle age, not middle age children, <laughs> middle school children. Um, if you've got elementary all the way to middle school children, I think just using these two resources along with, you know, recipes, uh, you know, and other projects that you could do from across that whole region of the world, then I think that would be a really lovely main lesson block that would not include too much heavy reading, but include a lot of information and enjoyment. Okay, so the other book that we used primarily for her, but of course my son listened to, was The Amazing Travels of Ibn Battuta by uh, Fatima Sharafuddin. And the illustrations, I actually really like them. At first I was like kind of hesitant to like them, and then they really grew on me, and I, I totally love them now. I find them to be really rich and great illustration inspiration for your main lesson book and I find that the content also is really well done both picture books I find the content really well done uh, if if you could only choose one I would choose the traveling man only because I the illustrations speak to me just a little bit more but really these books are equal in their content in their illustrations uh, and everything about them they are wonderful additions I highly recommend both of them what I love, love, love about the picture books is that if you are diving into this unit study or diving into learning about um, a person, a traveler, a, a scientist, anything, when you're looking at a picture book, you're getting a really great overview of their their life and what they did, their travels, without having to read a thicker book. So I love picture books for that reason because they offer so much in such a beautiful space. Uh, so I, I love picture books. I love storybooks. I include them all the time. The ones that I don't care for are the ones that are written for toddlers that still look like they, like from the cover, they look like they're a picture book, a storybook that could be for elementary. And on occasion, I've purchased those books and not realizing that there's only maybe like one very simple sentence per page. Those ones I absolutely don't care for. Even, well, I can't say even for really young children. For really young children, I think it's really great. But for our educational purposes, I don't care for those. And when I've purchased them, uh, I, I want to say kind of on accident because I've I've really loved the illustrations or you haven't been able to see the insides of the book, then I just try to create my own stories with those books. Okay, so this book absolutely uh, incredible, a wonderful edition, and I highly recommend both picture books for um, for this unit. Okay, I want to share with you the two books that we actually didn't use at all before I share with you our recipes and our projects. The two books that we didn't get to were uh, Moorish Architecture and The Mosque of Cordoba Told to Children. The reason why we didn't get to these books, and you can see this is like a coffee table book. It's super beautiful, impressive, has lots of content. But the reason why we didn't get to this is because uh, the part of Ibn, Ibn Battuta's journey where he ends up going into Spain, he's going into Granada, uh, we, I just didn't collect books specifically on that area. I was collecting books more on 
Ibn Battuta himself versus specifically the locations where he went. But because I had these two books already in our home library, I wanted to include them, but we actually didn't get to them at all. I think these are really beautiful, impressive books that could coordinate with this unit, could coordinate with a Golden Age of Islam unit, could coordinate with a Spain unit, could coordinate with a geometry unit or an architecture unit. It It, it is a, a versatile book for all kinds of different units that you could put together. And I'm kind of sad that we didn't get to to this book at all, but I think just looking at the pictures is really inspiring. Even even if we are if, even if we aren't even if we aren't able to put together any projects or lessons that go along with it. So I did want to share it with you and tell you that we did not open this book at all for this unit, but we're still going to include it with all of these units that kind of circle around the Silk Road and basically the Middle Ages, because I think they're valuable resources. And then this one, the Mosque of Cordoba told to children, though we did not read this one with our Ibn Matuta unit, we are still going to be reading this one as part of our opening activities. Even though our unit is done, we're still going to include this as well as include it for some of our other units on uh, you know, on the golden age of Islam, because it is a picture book. It, this was, this is a kind of book that we might read maybe three or four pages a day as part of our opening activities. And then we'll circle back to it on a daily basis until we're done with it. And so I'm not going to abandon this book, but we just didn't get to it for this particular unit, but I did want to share it with you. It's really important that I share with you the books that we don't get to, as well as the books that we didn't like. So you can get a really good complete picture of everything that we have done. So let me put these ones aside and show you the last three books and the um, the project. Actually, let me show you the project really quickly. This is our version of the Kaaba uh, from what I imagined it to be in the um, in the twelfth, thirteenth, fourteenth century. I don't know that the black coverings were on at that point, but I do believe there were some coverings on the Kaaba, but I don't know what they were. And when we tried to make our own little black covering, it looked really kind of shabby and messy and it just, it didn't sit well with me to use that. So right now it's completely uncovered. It does have the roof that's a wooden top and it does have the bricks that I imagine them to be limestone, but I absolutely don't know. So if they're not and they were a different color, we can easily paint over this. It does have the raised door. Gosh, I hope I don't break that. There we go. It is on little, um, or on a single hinge that we actually just glued into place rather than screwed into place. So we do have our little wooden door and it is raised up. And I do believe that I had this in the right orientation, but we did not put our black stone on our Kaaba. And the reason why we have, well, I, this is in the playlist for this unit, but you wouldn't see a new video for how we, we made this Kaaba because we included this with our North uh, I'm sorry, with our West Africa unit for when we studied Mansa Musa and when he went on pilgrimage to Mecca. And so we included this in that unit. However, you could do this with your Ibn Battuta unit. You could also make a sandstone masjid, a sandstone mosque um, for your Ibn Battuta unit too, if you decided to, the ones that were typical of the Mali region, because we included that as well in our West Africa main lesson block. And that was an amazing project. I really, really liked the way that it turned out. And you could actually include that in your Ibn Battuta unit study since he did go and visit Mali. So anyway, so the, this is the project that we did that actually coordinates with multiple units because even when we studied Zhang He in uh, China in the 1300s, 1400s, sorry, I think the 1300s, his um, parents actually were both hajis. They had both um, done pilgrimage to Mecca. And so you could even do um, a Kaaba for that period of China's history because there are actually a lot of Muslims that live in China then and today. 
and uh, Zheng He was born Muslim and he did practice Islam throughout his life as well as incorporated some of the other beliefs of, of China into his practices either uh, politically or for you know the crew that he had on his ships maybe because they practiced other religions but that even the Kaaba could be included in that unit is what I'm trying to say <laughs> as well of, of course as our golden age of Islam and Silk Road and um, Ibn Battuta unit studies. Let's dive in to our cookbooks and um, and then I think that will be it. So we have Arabesque, a taste of Morocco, Turkey and Lebanon. And this is a gorgeous cookbook. The The whole presentation of this book is so beautiful. It's one that you would just leave out on your coffee table and be inspired by the um the the i was about to say the illustrations the photographs are stunning they're so they just make you so hungry and they make you want to cook everything in this book the recipes are really easy to follow i i really like the way that they're laid out it's probably like most recipe books but you know all all of the just the, the way that it's formatted makes it really easy to follow along and what's also really great about this book is that uh, in the beginning of the book, it also gives you a lot of background information about the different regions that you're going to be traveling through in this cookbook, um, how to use this book, and just a little background about each of those different countries where the recipes are coming from. So we use this book for a lot of our Silk Road units, but primarily for Ibn Battuta, we use some some recipes from the Morocco uh, section. And then we also included for our Islamic uh, Golden Age of Islam unit, we also included some of the recipes that were in Lebanon. I don't think we've done any of our turkey recipes. And so we will definitely be doing that again when we continue with our Golden Age of Islam unit. So highly recommend this book. It is super gorgeous. However, the majority of the recipes that you're going to see in this unit are actually from this book called Recipes from Morocco. Uh, this book was recommended to me by my friend Laura, who's married to a Moroccan who makes amazing food. She and her husband cook amazing food. And I uh, finally asked her about uh, some of the resources that she uses. Primarily, she her husband comes up with a lot of you know the, the recipes that they make based on what his mother made and the foods that he had growing up, but she does use this book as a resource for, um, for her recipes. And so on, on this playlist, you're going to find recipes for couscous, which are completely from my friend Laura and her husband, Nordine. And then you're going to find a recipe for harira soup. And I got that from my friend Laura. And this is the recipe that she gave me. And then we also included another maybe six or seven recipes from this book that we did for our own little miniature Moroccan feast. And you're going to find all of those recipes uh, on the playlist because we've already done in our in our home, we already cook a lot of couscous and tagine anyway. I decided to explore other recipes. But if you're just going to choose a couple of recipes, then couscous and tagine like those are going to just be such iconic recipes for Morocco oh, and Harira soup that you probably would skip some of the other offerings in this book. Uh, but because we wanted to explore some new recipes, we went ahead and we tried um, several recipes. And so the way that I did that was to include my favorite planning tool of all, and that's the full, full back post-its. They're um, full back sticky post-its. I love them because they, they don't tear up easily and they don't get lost and wrinkled and everything. They stay in place. And so what I did was I wrote down all of the recipes that we were inspired to do, the page numbers, and then I created a shopping list for myself, got all the things that we needed. And if there were some ingredients that we just couldn't access, then we just used some alternatives. But for the most part, these recipes contain things that were really easy for us to uh, find and to incorporate into our own uh, our own recipes that we typically use anyway. So the winner, <laughs> well, they were all really good, but the the standout recipe that we did was this one called fish soup. 
It was so delicious. Oh, I should say that when we're doing our recipes, I usually cut the recipe in half or even down to just a quarter of the ingredients because we're not sure how we're going to like it. And sometimes we want to explore a lot of recipes and enjoy them. It does take a lot of time when you do that, but sometimes we want to explore them and, and figure out what we like and then we can make it again. So I made half of this recipe and it was so, so, so delicious that before we were even done with the soup and I was still creating other recipes from this cookbook, we straight away went and made it again because it was that good. So this fish recipe, highly recommended. All right, the last book, uh, which you did not see when we put this unit together, is our Atlas book. It's the Children's Atlas of the World. And we used this book, we use this book extensively in pretty much all of our history units. And we, of course, used it for our, it, my son, my 14 year old son used it when he was doing his map making uh, illustrations for his main lesson book. And so we used um, these maps in here. Plus, it's also a book that you just kind of get carried away and you just look at the illustrations. And I like how there's going to be just the physical map, but then you can also find the political maps. And then you can also find uh, maps like this where they're they're going to have little icons that explain like say something that's historical or uh, you know animals that you can find in the region or certain products that are produced or grown there so I like this um, aspect of the atlas I have been on the hunt for a new atlas but I haven't ever actually like I say that I want to get a new atlas, but I haven't made any efforts in looking for a new atlas. And so this one has worked really well for our family. It was a hand-me-down. I do not remember who I got it from or where you can find this. However, I feel like most atlases are going to be um, a great addition to your homeschool library, regardless of, you know, the size or, you know, how old it is. Uh, or maybe how old it is. <laughs> maybe you should get a current one. Uh, I think they're going to be a great asset to your homeschool. So I can't really recommend any particular one. This is just the one that we happen to be using. It's the Reader's Digest Children's Atlas of the World. Don't remember when it is published, but I, I would say you don't have to necessarily hunt down this one in particular. This one's from 1998. Uh, but do have an atlas or a globe um, when you're going over your history. And I think it's really, really helpful. Okay. I think that covers it all. <laughs> Thank you so much for staying with me to hear my thoughts and reflections on this unit. I totally thought this was going to be a really short video. Boy, was I wrong. Um, don't forget that you can check out some of the video tutorials that we did for our Ibn Battuta unit by tapping on the screen right now. You can also check out the complete blog post that has all this information, it's on my website at pepperandpine.com. You can find that link down in the description box below. And if you want to see what we're eating and what the projects are that we're doing and how we're homeschooling on a daily basis, you can find me on Instagram at pepperandpine.